Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is ideology in the United Nations General Assembly. We've talked a lot about the United Nations, but so far our focus has been on the Security Council. That's for good reason. For a resolution to be binding in the United Nations, it has to pass through the Security Council, and that's easier said than done because the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China all have veto power. And as a result, all of the big games in the United Nations tend to be played in the Security Council. But that's not to say that the General Assembly isn't useful for a different reason. The General Assembly is a bigger body. It contains every country in the United Nations. They all get a vote in the General Assembly. But the key difference here is that General Assembly votes are not binding, unlike Security Council votes. Nevertheless, that will still help us answer the big question for this lecture, which is how do preferences differ in the world? And the reason is because UN General Assembly votes are on the public record. So we can see them as scholars of international relations. We can look at all of these votes, and we can use these votes to calculate preferences for states. In other words, we can figure out where their ideology lies on a spectrum. So this is going to be very similar to spectrums that you would see in domestic politics, like in the United States or the United Kingdom, with left-right spectrums, where you have a legislative body or a parliament, and you have members in those legislative bodies or in those parliaments, and they all have different personal ideological, ideological lines, and you can measure that by seeing how they vote on any particular bill. Same thing is going on here with the General Assembly. We see what the issues are in any General Assembly vote. We see how states have voted on it, and we can use that as a way of measuring how tight or how far away any two countries are. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than the left-right spectrum that we do see in domestic politics, because when we talk about left-right in that sense, we're thinking about how, say, conservatives on the right are more free market and people on the left, liberals on the left, are not so much. Well, this is different here because this left-right spectrum is not referring to that. It is referring to basically openness and the liberal order that the United States has largely been championing for the last, well, ever since the United Nations was created after World War II, so it's been a while. Now, again, this is going to be confusing because in this case, when we're talking about being pro-liberal, that's going to put you on the right end of the spectrum, and if you are not so much down for the new liberal order that the United States has been trying to implement in the world following World War II, you're going to be lying further to the left. Again, that's confusing. Being right here is more liberal and more associated with what the United States would like. Being left is the opposite of that. So if we take all of this General Assembly voting data and we process it, we compare how likely two countries are to be voting with one another, and then plot that onto this sort of spectrum, we can come up with, well, very nice plots. So this is how the General Assembly voting data looked like in 1962. So this is at the height of the Cold War, and we see that the Soviet Union is all the way on the left, right? So it's got a very low score. It's in the negatives where zero, which is not actually lined up in the center of your screen because there's this slant that we're going to be seeing heading towards more and more the U.S. liberal order on the right as time progresses. Uh, but nevertheless, we see that the Soviet Union is all the way on the left and the United States and the United Kingdom are all the way on the right and a bunch of other countries are lying in between there. Now, unsurprisingly, and as I previewed, as time progresses, we're going to be seeing the United States' liberal order actually continuing and, and being more and more preferred by states in the UN General Assembly. So this is what it looked like in 1962. And let's fast forward about two and a half decades later to 1988, right before the Cold War ends. You can see that there's a huge shift toward the right, toward the United States. And in fact, the United States is actually getting its own ideal point further out there to the right. And now the Soviet Union is no longer the most left on the spectrum. It's actually gone to Syria, which will stay there over time, even actually all the way to today. And if we actually jump four years later to 1992, at the end of the Cold War, so now the Cold War has ended, the Soviet Union is no longer the Soviet Union, its chief successor state is Russia, where does Russia lie on the spectrum? Well, suddenly Russia is actually very moderate. We see that Russia is falling in between New Zealand on its left and Japan on its right. And again, we're seeing a shift to the right here toward the United States and toward the liberal order that follows World War II that the United States tries to promote. And it's now Cuba in 1992 that's all the way on the left. So we see that Russia, again, has moved toward the right, toward the United States, over time as the Cold War ended. 
However, this is going to reverse itself, and 2012 is the last year that we have data for this. And if we look at that, we see that Russia has moved back to the left, and in fact, the world has shifted toward the left since then. So the United States is still all the way on the right. And you can see that I've labeled a few other interesting countries here, like the other veto, uh, veto players on the United Nations Security Council. We still have Cuba very much on the left. All the way at the end is North Korea and Iran. You can see that there are two points there that are right next to each other, basically overlapping each other. And in between uh, North Korea, Iran, and Cuba, we have Syria right there as well, being the United States' chief antagonists going on in ideological space in the General Assembly voting data. So what this means here is think about the United States trying to consider whether to fight a war against a country like Canada. Well, you see that Canada and the United States are very close ideolo ideologically, which means that the United States really doesn't have much in in, cont in in contrast or in contest with Canada. So that means that the United States fighting a war against Canada isn't actually going to produce very many benefits for the United States because the United States is basically getting what they already want out of Canada. Canada is very happy to do what the United States wants to do most of the time because the United States and Canada actually share the same ideological positioning relative to the rest of the world. Now, this is in contrast to the United States and North Korea or Iran. The United States and North Korea and Iran are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So there's a lot more that the United States and North Korea disagree on, and a lot more that the United States and Iran disagree on, which means all other things being equal, there's more worth fighting for if you're the United States and you're thinking about going to war against North Korea or Iran versus Canada. So this is the basic spectrum plots of UN General Assembly voting data. And this actual data set, uh, this data set actually contains a lot of other interesting things too. So for example, we can calculate who China is closest to in terms of percentage of votes agreed on. So this is 2012, the percentage of votes that these particular countries agreed on with China, voted in the same way as China. We see that Nauru has actually a perfect match with China. 100% of its votes match China's. And we see that the rest of these countries here, well, a lot of them you've actually heard of. You've probably heard of most of those countries remaining on the list. And we see that most of these fall in the Middle East and Africa. So that's where China is getting most of its support from in the General Assembly. We can also do this for, say, Israel. So these are the percentage of votes in 2012 that these countries agreed on with Israel. And we see that the United States is closest to Israel here. You could actually see that going back a couple of slides on the plot of the 2012 ideological spectrum. And we see a bunch of other countries in the West mostly are coming out of here and voting along with Israel. We can also do a few more fun facts. So the most agreeable country, the country that votes most uh, yeses, than, more yeses than any other country, are actually tied. It's Chile and the Dominican Republic. Out of 68 votes in 2012, they voted yay on 67 of them. In contrast, the United States is the country most likely to vote no. They have 45 nays in 2012. A lot of that is coming from the fact that a lot of these general assembly votes are concerning Israel and against Israel coming from countries in the Middle East that are against Israel. And so the United States is voting nay a lot of the time because of that. They are voting nay on these resolutions that are against Israel. Uh, we could also give a honey badger award for not giving a, well, you know, in other words, how many times does a particular country abstain? Cameroon leads this one with 24 abstentions in 2012. And lastly, the most confusing country is now the reason for that, or the reason I'm giving that award, is that this country has the weakest estimate. So again, when we are looking at this voting data, we are trying to guess where a particular country lies on an ideological spectrum. And the way we do that is by inferring from these votes. But this is a noisy process. We can't actually say for sure that the United States lies on a specific point on the spectrum. We can guess that it's there, but it might be a little bit to the left and it might be a little bit to the right. And based on how strange your voting pattern is, how all over the place your votes are, that gap, that confidence interval from where we think your ideal point is versus where it could also reasonably lie is going to be larger if you're going to be having more confusing voting patterns. And Nauru actually leads this. And actually, if you look at the last two slides, Nauru was the, the country most likely to vote with China and the fifth most likely uh, fifth most likely country to vote with Israel. And that actually should strike you as being very confusing because if you remember back to the 2012 spectrum map, Israel and the United States were the two countries furthest to the right, and China was the United States' chief major power antagonist on the left, and yet Nauru is often agreeing with both of those countries, which is strange. 
So those are some fun facts. The big key takeaway here, though, is that state preferences are not identical. We can see that by just looking at those ideological spectrums. Some countries are on the left, some countries are on the right, some countries are in the middle. They are not all in the same place. Now, this should seem obvious. I think that anyone who has not had much experience reading international relations theory and international relations history, that should be very obvious to those people. However, international relations scholars for the longest time, for decades, often argued that all states were essentially identical except for size and power. So the United States in this world, in this theory that was oftentimes uh, claimed back in international relations scholarly history, well, uh, that United States and a country like Syria or a country like Cuba were identical in its preferences or identical in their preferences, except the only thing that was different about them is that the United States was a bigger country with more military power than Cuba or Syria was. And as this data, I think, very conclusively shows, that's not the case. Some countries want some things from the world, some countries want exact opposite things in the world, and some countries lie in the middle. So that's what the UN General Assembly voting data allows us to, uh, to infer. And if you want to take a look at this, uh, this data set in further detail, you can check the video description and I'll send you a link, uh, I'll actually leave a link there for you to click on and so you can take a look at that. Hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.